الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا قبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الحبيب المرسلين محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد قال جل وعلا إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد قال جل وعلا لا تقنت من رحمة الله وقال جل وعلا إنه لا ييئس من روح الله إلا القوم الكافرون Respected ulama, respected elders, brothers and mighty ones, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. After praising the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending salutations upon our beloved Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I begin as always by first thanking you, my host, for giving me this opportunity to convey the message of Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I pray to the Almighty Allah that Allah accepts these efforts of yours in listening to this message, as I pray to the Almighty Allah that Allah accepts these efforts of mine in trying to deliver the message of Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as it was revealed upon our beloved Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in its, true, in its true and pure form over 1400 years ago. My young friends, I'm sure you will agree that the last 50 years plus have been very, very difficult for the Muslims. All around the globe, Kashmir, what do we see? Muslims persecuted and tortured in a manner that if I were to relate just one story, it would make the hair on your body stand. Men are imprisoned while their daughters in their absence are raped by occupying forces and the civilized world turns a blind eye. Similarly was and still is the situation in Palestine. Have you ever seen an open prison bigger than the one in Gaza? 1.5 million Muslims in an open prison deprived of basic human rights. They say we live in a civilized world, yet the atrocities that are committed today probably were not even committed in the Dark Ages. What have the so-called Muslim countries offered the Muslims in the last 50 years plus? This, my young friends, that some don't even allow you to practice the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would have desired for his deen to be practiced after his departure. In so-called some Muslim countries, if you offer the five daily prayers on a regular basis, you adorn your face with the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you beautify your bodies with the libas of Islam. My young friends, don't be surprised if you are troubled, maybe even imprisoned by the authorities. This is some of the so-called Muslim countries. By the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we Muslims living in the West have had more religious freedom than some of our Muslim brethren living in the Muslim world. That is up to very recent. Now, all of a sudden, even for people like yourself and myself living in the West, the earth, in spite of its vastness, 
is becoming tighter and the grip is becoming stronger by the day. Now my young friends, on a daily basis, we are slaughtered by the media. On a daily basis, our freedoms are restricted. We can no longer say and do what we could say and do before. Our airports, we are singled out. How many of us have experienced this? Hours of routine questions. Every single one of us is perceived a terrorist till he or she can prove his or her innocence. This is today. And only Allah and Allah alone knows what tomorrow will bring. Now my young Muslim brothers and sisters living in the West, when they ponder over this global situation of the Muslims, this humiliation and this killing, bombing of even hospitals, destruction of Muslim homes, killing of men, women, and even innocent children are not spared. When my young Muslim brothers and sisters living in the West, when they ponder over this global situation of the Muslims, they naturally feel hurt. Some of them feel so hurt, I'm talking about a minority which you can count on your hands, on your fingers. Some of them feel so hurt that they are prepared to hurt others. Whereas some feel so hurt that they're losing hope. Losing hope in the mercy of Allah, losing hope in Allah, losing hope in the power of Allah and turning away from Islam. My young friends, this is the reason that I'm here today to tell you. لا تقنتوا من رحمة الله Do not despair. Do not lose hope. Do not make haste. My young friends, this is not the end of the Muslims and this is not the end of Islam. There is no power in this universe that can put an end to the Muslims and that can put an end to Islam and that can extinguish the flame of Islam, the nur of Islam, the light of Islam other than the being that created Islam and that created the Muslims. Other than this one being, there is no power within this universe that can put an end to Islam. Where are they going to be able to put an end to Islam today? When we are over a billion strong, when my young friends, yesterday, when there was only one individual that declared, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, in the deserts of Mecca, my young friends, the whole of Arabia, united, couldn't put an end to this one individual. And they tried from the moment he declared La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, right till Makkah was conquered. Around 20 years after this, they tried by day and by night. And they all united. And they couldn't put an end to this one individual. And the kalima La ilaha illallah prevailed. And the verses of the Quran were revealed. إذا جاء نصر الله والفت ورأيت الناس يدخلون في دين الله أقواجا فصبح بحمد ربك واستغفر إنه كان توابا When yesterday the whole of Arabia couldn't put an end to one believer Where will the world of today? My young friends When we are 
a billion plus strong, be able to put an end to the Muslims and put an end to the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only the being that created Islam will be able to put an end to Islam. And he will do so shortly just before the final hour. Allah will send a breeze and it will blow and it will enter the armpit of every believer whereby he will die. And soon thereafter, my young friends, when the believers remain no more, this dunya will remain no more. At this moment in time, we are going through a very difficult period. My young friends, this is not the first time. It has happened before. It is happening today. It will happen tomorrow. This is the sunnah of Allah. It's the way of Allah. This is not an end to Islam. My young friends, Islam will rise again. Islam will spread far and wide. And the halat and the situation of the Muslims will improve. And I have yaqeen in this. Not because I'm saying this, my young friends, the Nabi of Allah, Salawatullahi wa salam, who Ali said this, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that the final hour will not come till a man will rise from my ummah. His name will be like my name. His father's name will be like my father's name. He will fill the earth with justice, just as it was filled with oppression and tyranny. So this man will come and Islam will spread and people will declare the kalima La ilaha illallah Muhammad al-Rasulullah. My young friends, it is only natural and it's only human to feel hurt. If we did not feel hurt and if we did not feel this pain, my young friends, then there would be a question mark on our humanity. This pain you and I are feeling at this moment in time because of all the sufferings, whether it's in the blessed land of Sham or whether it's in Rohingya, Burma or whether it's in Somalia, whether it's in Afghanistan and whether it's in Kashmir or Palestine. My young friends, this is a sign of our Iman. Not only is it a sign of our Iman, it's a sign of Tamil Iman, perfect Iman. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al-Mu'minuna ka rajulin wahid, in ishtaka aynuhu ishtaka kulluh, wa in ishtaka ra'suhu ishtaka kulluh. That the entire Muslim Ummah is like a single body. If any one limb of this body is in pain, then the entire body feels this pain. The entire body responds with sleeplessness. The entire body responds with restlessness. The entire body responds with anxiety. If the eye is in pain, then the entire body feels the pain of the eye. If the head is in pain, then the entire body feels the pain of the head. If any one Muslim is in pain, then the entire Ummah of Muhammad وسلم, feels the pain of this ill believer. Today, my young friends, it's not about one Muslim in pain. The entire Muslim Ummah from Afghanistan all the way to the blessed land of Sham and from Rohingya all the way to Palestine is suffering. My young friends, it's an Iman that people like yourself and myself who Allah has given afiyat and kept in good health that we feel the pain of our Muslim brothers that are suffering worldwide. My young friends, our beloved Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, never mind being able to tolerate the suffering of a believer. My young friends, such was the concern of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for his ummah that our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam couldn't even tolerate the cry of a believer. The hadith comes to mind. Our beloved Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the thing that he loved most of all was standing before the Almighty Allah in prayer. And he would stand before the Almighty Allah in the latter part of the night. For hours on end, he would begin Surah Al-Fatiha. He would finish Fatiha. And he would begin Surah Al-Baqarah. He would read the whole of Baqarah. He would finish this. And he would begin Ali Imran. He would finish all of Ali Imran. And he would begin Surah Nisa. 
and he would do this because he himself would say, Kurratu aini fi salah, that the contentment of my eyes lies in salah. Rasulullah would get this buzz and peace when he stood before the Almighty Allah and he conversed with Allah and he, when, he would speak, when he would speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he would stand for hours on end and you, my young friends because he would stand for so long the hadith of Rasulullah says Hatta tawarramat qadama, that the blessed feet of Rasulullah would swell and when the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala would, would see the feet of Rasulullah they would say Ya Rasulullah why do you exert yourself so much? Why do you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much? Why do you strive and sacrifice and stand before the Almighty Allah for hours and end? When you are Sayyidul Awwaleen wal Akhirin, you are the leader of the former and you are the leader of the latter. Shafi al Muslimin, you will intercede for the wrongdoers on the day of judgment, and because of your intercession, the wrongdoers will go inside paradise. Ya Rasulullah, your maqam is so high. Ka inna Allah kad that Allah has forgiven all your sins. Yani ghafar means barrier. Allah has placed a barrier between you and sin. You can't even wrong Allah. You can't even commit wrong. This is how high your maqam is. When such is your maqam, why do you exert yourself? And why do you strive and sacrifice so much that your blessed feet swell? Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded and replied to the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala jama'in. If this is the maqam of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that Allah has purified Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Allah has honored Muhammad, should this not be an incentive for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to strive and sacrifice and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even more? Afala akun abdan shakura and be a grateful servant of Allah. This was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when it came standing before the Almighty Allah and, uh, and praying. Now, now, list, bearing this hadith in mind, now listen to the hadith of Sayyidina Anas radiallahu ta'ala an. Sayyidina Anas radiallahu ta'ala an relates hadith. Anna nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, kana yasma'u buka'a sabiyya wa huwa fi salati, fayaqra'u bisurati al-qasira. That Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he led the prayer, if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as much as heard a child crying in salah, though he got a buzz in salah, and though he liked standing before the Almighty Allah for hours on, on end, because he enjoyed the, 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 the conversing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my young friends, when he heard as much as a child cry in salah, Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would shorten the prayer and quickly finish off the prayer. Realizing, uh, realizing that this would trouble the mother, realizing this will bring taklif to the mother to ease the suffering of the mother. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would shorten the prayer. This is why my young friends, because Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam felt the pain of the believers, felt the pain of his ummatis, my young friends, not once in his entire life did Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ever send a beggar away. Not once. Whatever he had, my young friends, he would give, he would give. If they ask for a morsel in his hand, that morsel wouldn't reach the mouth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And he would take that morsel and he would give it, up to give it to that better. If, he, if they ask for a morsel inside his mouth, my young friends, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa wouldn't swallow that morsel. The Nabi of Allah would take out that morsel and give it to the beggar, my young friends. So much so that days would go by. كان يبيت الليالي المتتابعة طاويا هو وأهله لا يجدون عشان. Consecutive days would go by, and Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his family would sleep hungry. Months would go by, and nothing would be cooked in the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. On one occasion, he said to Aisha, "O Aisha, O Fatima, this is the third after." After three days, this is the first meal that your father is eating. Whatever he had, he would give. And if, the, if Rasulullah had nothing, even then, my young friends, the Nabi of Allah would not turn this beggar away. He would say to this beggar, go to such and such a person and take a loan from him and tell that person, do not worry, Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, has taken the responsibility of repaying your debt. I ask you, my young friends, what did Prophet Wasallam say to Abu Mas'ud when he saw Sayyidina Abu Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala beating his slave, reprimanding his slave? My young friends, Nabi Kareem sallallahu wasallam, feeling grieved and saddened, said to Abu Mas'ud, Oh Abu Mas'ud, 
You are beating him now. You are reprimanding him here and now in the dunya. Remember, Allah has more power over you than you have over this slave. Allah has more power over you than you over this slave. As soon as Sayyidina Abu Masood heard the words of Rasulullah, Sayyidina Abu Masood began to shake and shiver, realizing his error and wrong. There and then, he said, Ya Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I free him for the sake of Allah, the Nabi of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Masood. Oh Abu Masood, had you not done this, then the fire of hell would have certainly touched you. My young friends, if this was the Nabi of Allah, salawatullahi wa salamu that he could not even tolerate the cry of a believer, that he would stop his salah, he would finish off his salah, he would shorten his salah. I ask you, my young friends, if Rasulullah sallallahu was alive today, here amongst us, here today, and with his own eyes, he saw what is happening to his ummah in the blessed land of Sham, in the city of Halb. He saw what is happening to his ummah in Rahinga. He saw what is happening to his ummah in Somalia. What is happening to his ummah in Palestine. What is happening to his ummah in Afghanistan. I ask you, my young friends, how would the Nabi of Allah, who Allah describes, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ Oh Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you are, you are a mercy, a mercy for the mankind, a mercy for the humankind, a mercy for the jinn kind, a mercy for even the animal kind, a mercy for the plant kind, a mercy for whatever is out there, wherever it may be. O oh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you are a mercy for all. If that Nabi was amongst us here today and were to see this with his own blessed eyes, I ask you, my young friends, how would Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam feel? Nabi that couldn't even tolerate the cry of a believer. Such was the concern that our beloved Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had for his ummah, my young friends, that he would spend the entire night begging for Allah's mercy for his ummah. On one occasion, he's in sajda and he won't raise his head from sajda till Allah himself says, O oh Muhammad, raise your head. I will not disgrace you with regards to your ummah. I will make you happy with regards to your ummah. On another occasion, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is in prostration. And he spent the entire night reciting the verse of the Quran. Give Allah into azibhum fa innahum ibaduk. If you punish them, then verily they are your servants. You can do as you please. O oh Allah, wa in taqfir lahum fa inna ka anta al aziz al hakim. And O oh Allah, if you forgive them and you can so easily forgive them because you are the arham al rahimin, the akram al akramin, the ajwad al ajwadin. You are the Almighty and you are the All Wise. The whole night he spent reciting the verse of the Quran in sajda. وَإِن تَخْفِرْ لَهُمْ وَإِن تُعَذِّبْهُمْ فَإِنُّمْ إِبَادُكْ وَإِن تَخْفِرْ لَهُمْ فَإِنَّكَ أَنْتُ الْأَزِيزُ الْأَكِيمُ And tears are flowing from his eyes. He did not forget his ummah. Not once in the dunya. And my young friends, he will not forget his ummah on the day of judgment. When the whole of mankind will be resurrected. Plane of resurrection. Billions and billions of people are there. The sun is above your heads. You are naked, just like the day your mother gave you birth. You are barefooted, just like the day your mother gave you birth. You are uncircumcised, just like the day the mother, your mother gave you birth. The sun is above your head, and you are literally drowning in sweat. Tears are flowing from your eyes. So many tears, my young friends, that when these tears come to an end, blood will flow from your eyes. So much blood that if you take a bow and place it inside your tears, it'll begin to it'll, it'll, it'll begin to flow and move because of the sheer amount of blood tears that have come from your eyes. When this is the situation of the whole of mankind, and now you're looking for help, you will come to Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, and you will say, "Fashfa lana ila Rabbi, ala tara ma nahnu fi." Oh Adam, you are the first of Allah's creation. Allah chose you. You are the chosen one. Intercede for us. As Adam alayhi salatu was salam was saying, you know, by, I can't go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah told me not to go near a certain tree. I don't know what my outcome will be. Inna rabbi kad ghadib al yawma ghadban. Lam yaghdab qablahu misrahu. Wa lam yaghdab ba'dahu misrahu. Allah is angry today. Allah has never been angry like this before. Allah will never be angry like this 
again, go to Nuh alayhi salam. You'll come to Nuh alayhi salam. Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam will turn you away. And he'll say, nafsi, nafsi. Guys, I'm only worried about myself. I don't know what my outcome is going to be. I curse my ummah. I prayed against them. I said, Rabbi la tazhar ala al-ard min al-kafirin dayyara. Innaka in tazharhum yudhillu ibadak. Wa la yalidu illa fajran kafara. Go to Ibrahim. He was the khalil of Allah. He was the one that Allah befriended. He was the one that made the house of Allah in Makkah al Mukarramah. You'll approach Ibrahim, the Khalil of Allah. He will turn you away and he'll say, Nafsi, Nafsi, today I'm only concerned about myself. Go to Musa Kalimullah. You'll come to Musa Kalimullah. He will turn you away, my young friends, and say, okay, Today, Nafsi, Nafsi, Nafsi. You'll come to Isa Ruhullah. He will turn you away. And then finally, my young friends, you will come to the Habib of Allah. You will come to none other than our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Rasulullah sallallahu wa sallam will come and he will fall in prostration and he will praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with words with which Allah has never been praised before and Allah will place these words in the heart of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love this so much that his Habib is prostrating on the plane of resurrection that he'll say Ya Muhammad irfa ra'sak sal tu'ta wa shfa'tu shaffa Oh Muhammad raise your head you are so dear to me ask for whatever you like it will be given to you intercede your intercession will be accepted tell me what you require and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when every other prophet will say nafsi 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 just like he did not forget you in the dunya he will not forget you in the akhirah and he will say ya Allah ummati ummati oh Allah look at my ummah it's suffering I beg you come and judge the ummah come and take care of the ummah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will come and judge mankind Never forgot you in the dunya, will never forget you in the akhirah. If that Nabi was alive today, my young friends, I ask you, my young friends, how do you think the Nabi of Allah would feel with what's happening in the, uh, in the blessed land of Palestine, the blessed land of Sham, and every other corner of the Muslim world? Don't you think that Nabi of Allah would feel pain? Indeed! Indeed, the Nabi of Allah would feel pain. Words can't describe the pain that Rasulullah would feel when he could not even tolerate the cry of a believer, of a child in Salah. How would Rasulullah respond? My young friends, word can't even describe the pain of the Nabi of Allah. So this pain that you and I are feeling is an Iman. It's a sign of Kamil Iman, my young friends. If we did not, Feel the pain of our Muslim brothers that are suffering, then there would be a question mark on our Iman. But my young friends, feeling pain is one thing, and losing hope in Allah is entirely a different thing. It is not befitting for a true believer to lose hope in Allah, to lose hope in the mercy of Allah, to lose hope in the power of Allah. Even if such becomes of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that more or less every single believer, my young friends, is cut to bits. His body is mutilated. His skin and his flesh is stripped from his bone, my young friends. Even then, it is not befitting and permissible for a believer to lose hope in Allah, to lose hope in the mercy of Allah, to lose hope in the power of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, لا ييأس من روح الله إلا القوم الكافرون Only those that don't believe in Allah, those that don't believe in the mercy of Allah, those that don't believe in the power of Allah, they are the only ones that lose hope in Allah, mercy of Allah, power of Allah, by the grace of Allah, my young friend. You are a believer. I am a believer. You declare the kalima, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. I declare the kalima, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. We believe in Allah. We believe in the power of Allah. We believe Allah is the Lord of the Arsh and Kursi. Allah is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. Allah is the Lord of the entire universe. Allah is the Rabb of whatever exists out there. Wherever it may be, my young friends. Allah is the Khalik, the Malik, and the Razik. Allah is the Qadir. Allah is the one that has the power. Has had the power, has the power, and will always have the power. He is the possessor of Kun fayakun. Whenever Allah desires anything, all Allah says be. And within a zillionth of a second, that thing comes into existence. This is the Allah that you and I believe in, my young friends. Allah is the one that responded to the cry of the Yusuf alayhi salam when his brothers wronged him and took him as a child and threw him inside the darkness of the world. And he called upon Allah and Allah took care of him. Allah is the one that responded to the cry of the Yunus alayhi salatu wasalam. As the Yunus alayhi salatu wasalam is in the 
stomach of a whale. There's a darkness of the stomach. Then there's a darkness of the night. Then there's a darkness of the sea. He's so close to the seabed inside the stomach of a whale that whilst he's inside the whale, he can hear the stones on the seabed glorifying Allah. This is when Hazrat Yunus alayhi salatu wasalam calls to Allah, La ilaha illa anta subhanak. Oh Allah, there is no God worthy of worship but you. Subhanak, you are free and pure from all defect as and false. Inni kuntu min al Oh Allah, verily I was from amongst the zalimin. I was from amongst the wrongdoers. My young friends, he called upon Allah. فَنَجَّيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْغَمْ وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah responded to the call and cry of Hazrat Yunus alayhi salam and Allah came to his aid. Allah is the one that took care of Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam when they threw him inside the fire. The command of Allah came. Ya nar, kuni bardan wa salaman ala Ibrahim. Oh fire become cold and peaceful upon Ibrahim. And when the command of Allah came, any fire that was burning on the dunya, my young friends became cold and peaceful thinking that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing it. Allah is the one that took care of the believers in the battle of Badr. When there's a mere 313, Hufatan, Uratun, my young, my young friends, barefooted. Some of them don't even have shoes to wear. Some of them don't even have two sheets of cloth to wear. Some of them are carrying broken sticks and they're fighting a power of the time. The mighty Quraysh of Makkah, a thousand strong, that have the war horses, that have the, the war camels, my young friends. Allah is the one that took care of the believers in that very nazuk, very difficult time. You know, that was the decider. al farik bin al haqqi wal batil The battle of Badr, my young friends. Allah is the one that took care of the believers. I ask you, my young friend, the Allah that has always taken care of the believers, do you think that Allah doesn't have the power to take care of the believers today? Indeed, Allah has always had the power. Allah will always have the power, my young friends. But there's a thing that you and I need to realize is, what you and I need to realize is, with Iman will come test. With Iman will come trials. With Iman will come difficulty. You can't have Iman without test, trial and difficulty. It's lazim malzum. Wherever there is Iman, there will always be some form of test. Always be some trial, even if it's minute. There will always be some difficulty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Alif la meem, ahasib an nasu an yutraku, an yuqulu amanna, wa hum la yuftanun. Do you think that you'll say, la ilaha illallah, and that's about it? After that, it will be plain sailing to Allah. Allah just can't wait to embrace you. And Jannah can't wait to embrace you. There will be no such thing as trials. There will be no such thing as difficulties. There will be no such thing as calamities. And my young friends, you'll just go into Jannah just like this. And Allah will shower you with blessings in the dunya. And Allah will shower you with the blessings in the akhirah. Who is waiting to embrace you so beautiful that the beauty of their faces will put the sun and moon to shun. Is that what you think? Is that how easy do you think it's going to be? Just say, La ilaha illallah, and that's it. Everything will be cool. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Am hasibtum an tadkhulu al-jannata, wa lamma ya'tikum, mathalu al-lathina khalaw min qablikum, masadhum al-ba'sa, wa al-darra, wa zulzilu, hatta yaqul al-rasul, wa al-lathina amanu ma'ahu mata nasrullah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Do you think that you'll just enter jannah just like this with ease? Yet you haven't been tested. You haven't been tested like those before you were tested. Those before you were tested in such a manner that they were afflicted with difficulties and calamities. So many difficulties, so many calamities. Wazulzilu, they were shaken so much that the Quran says, Hatta yakul al Rasul, Walladina Amanu Ma'ahu Matana Surullah. That even the messenger and the believer began to say, When will the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala come? Allah says again. You didn't get it the first time. You didn't get it the second time. Maybe you'll get it the third time. Allah says, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِّنَ الْأَنْوَالِ وَالْأَنْفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ Kid, it's not going to be an easy ride in the dunya. In the, this dunya, الدُّنْيَا سِجْنُ الْمُؤْمِنِ وَجَنَّةُ الْكَافِرِ For you, the believer, this dunya is not a place to enjoy. It's a prison. In prison, you only get the basics. You're deprived of many luxuries whilst you're inside the prison. For a believer, you will be deprived of many things whilst you're in the dunya. There will be difficulties. There will be 
calamities. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ Sometimes there will be fear. Your enemy will get the better of you. Just as at this moment in time, your enemy is getting the better of you. وَالْجُوْ There will be hunger, just like very recently there was in Halb. وَنَقْسِ مِنَ الْأَنْوَالِ وَالْأَنْفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ Sometimes there will be loss of wealth, loss of fruits, loss of properties, loss of lives. Your children will die. Your wife will die. Your mother and father will die. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, this is what will happen in the dunya. My young friends, why don't you and I realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give you and I Jannah. There is nothing more valuable than Jannah. Everything that is of value has a price. It has a high, high price. Look at the price of gold. Look at the price of silver. Look at the price of oil. Look at the price of platinum. These things are of value. Man needs these things. Look at the price of these things. My young friends, anything that is of value has a high price. There is nothing more valuable than the Jannah of Allah. Allah. The Prophet said, Ala inna ghaliya. Ala inna al -jannah. The Jannah of Allah has a price, it has the higher pro highest price. What price does the Jannah of Allah have? Allah says in the Quran, Inna Allah hashtara min al mu'mineen anfusahum wa amwalahum bi anna lahum al jannah. Allah has purchased from the believers. What does Allah purchase? Allah has purchased their mal, their wealth. Allah has purchased their lives. And what will Allah give them once He take once once people give him their mal and their lives? Allah says, Bi anna lahumul jannah. This is when Allah will give you Jannah. You're gonna have to give Allah your wealth. You're gonna have to give Allah your life. And this is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you the Jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With Iman comes difficulty. With Iman comes test, and with Iman, Iman comes calamities. Why else do you think the Prophet ﷺ said, حُجِبَتِ النَّارُ بِالشَّحَوَاتِ وَحُجِبَتِ الْجَنَّةُ بِالْمَكَارِ That Jahannam is covered with desire. Just keep on fulfilling your desires from fornicating, gambling, taking dope, selling dope. You'll get to, Jahann you'll get to Jahannam. Why do you think the Prophet ﷺ said, حُجِبَتِ الْجَنَّةُ بِالْمَكَارِ That Jannah has been covered with things that you dislike. You don't like waking up in the morning to read your Fajr Salah and making wuzu with cold water. You don't like it. Jannah is covered with this. You don't like to give your zakat. Jannah is covered with this. You don't like to spend your money and go for hajj. Jannah is covered with this. This is what you'll have to do to get inside Jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you want Jannah? My young friends, then you're going to have to go through these difficulties. Yeah? This is the first thing that I want you to understand. Wherever there is Iman, there will be difficulty. And the second thing that I want you to understand is, my young friends, we are not the only ones that are being tested. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ We tested those before them. It is the way of Allah, the tariqah of Allah, call it the sunnah of Allah. My young friends, Allah has always tested believers. Allah is testing the believers and Allah will keep on testing the believers right till the day of judgment. What we're experiencing is nothing. My young friends, there are fitnas to come. Yeah. Great, great fitnas to come. Yeah. And there is no fitna than bigger than the fitna of the jal. Ma min nabiyin illa wa kad anzara ummatu wa al a'war al kazab. This is why the Prophet sallallahu said, There is not a nabi that did not warn his ummah of the one eyed liar, and that is the biggest fitna humans will ever face. So it's the way of Allah. Allah always has, t Allah has tested the believers, Allah is testing the believers, and Allah will always test the believers. Look at what Fir'aun would do to the Banu Israel when he was informed that a child will be born from amongst the Banu Israel on whose hands your kingdom will come to an end. What did Fir'aun start doing? He ordered his, his soldiers, his police, his army. The Quran says, يَسْتَضْئِفُ طَائِفَةً مِّنْهُمْ يُذَبِّحُ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ وَيَسْتَحِي نِسَاءَهُمْ Any male child that was born, his police would come. They would take the child as soon as the mother gave birth. And my young friends, they would slaughter the child in, right in front in the presence of the mother. He was such a zalim, yeah, an oppressor, that he didn't even spare his own wife, Asiya. He nailed her to the ground and he persecuted her so much that she turned to Allah and she begged for Allah's mercy. Allah relates her words in the Quran that she made dua. Rabbi bni li indaka baytan fil jannah. Oh Allah, I'm begging you, enough is enough. Oh Allah, I'm begging you, make for me a house in paradise. Wanajini min fir'auna wa amalih. Wanajini min qawmi zalimin. Oh Allah, I've had enough of this oppressor. Oh Allah, I beg you, save me from this oppressor and save me from this zalim. He didn't even spare his wife. 
I ask you, my young friends, what did our beloved Prophet ﷺ say to Sayyidina Khabbab? When Sayyidina Khabbab complained in the early days of Islam, my young friends, when they would take the likes of Bilal Habshi radiallahu ta'ala anhu, they would whip him by day and they would whip him by night. And when blood would gush from the blessed body of Bilal, they would drug him in the scorching heat of Arabia, my young friends, where temperatures exceed 45 to 50 degrees centigrade. And they would force him to lie on the burning sun. And they would take a large stone and they would place it on his chest. And they would say to him, O oh Bilal, لا تزالوا حكذا حتى تموت أو تكفر بمحمد وتعبد الله والأزر. Oh Bilal, we will do this every day, day in, day out, night in, night out. We will torment you, we will torture you, we will persecute, cut you, till you, do, till you do not leave the deen of Muhammad sallallahu and return to the worship of the idol Lat and Uzza. The likes of Khabbab, they were drug. Yeah, they were drug and they would brand his head with hot iron rods. They even threw him inside burning charcoal. The likes of Ammar ibn Yasir, they lit a fire, they threw him inside. It was the Nabi of Allah that made dua to Allah. Ya nar kuni bardan wa salaman ala Ammar, kama kunti ala Ibrahim. O oh fire, become cold and peaceful upon Ammar as you were upon Ibrahim. When this is how they would treat the believers on one occasion, Sayyidina Khabbab radiallahu ta'ala anu, turn to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ala tadu'ulana. I beg you, pray for us. I beg you, help us. What was the response of the Nabi of Allah? Let me remind you, my young friends. The Nabi of Allah said to Sayyidina Khabbab, O oh Khabbab, kad kana man qablakum yukhadhu rajul in, in the people before you, a man would be taken, a hole would be dug. Then this man, he would be placed inside this hole. Then a saw would be brought. It would be placed on his head and they would cut him into two pieces. Even then he would not turn from the deen of Allah. He wouldn't reject Allah. He wouldn't reject the deen of Allah. He wouldn't reject the kalima. He would leave this world. He would give his life, but he would leave this world with the words flowing from his lips. La ilaha illallah. There is no God worthy worship but Allah. وَيُمْشَقْ بِأَمْشَاطِ الْحَدِيدِ They would bring uh, combs of steel. And they would comb their bodies in such a manner that it would strip the skin and flesh from their bones. And even then, they wouldn't turn away from Allah. They wouldn't turn away from the deen of Allah. They wouldn't reject the kalima. They would give their lives and they would leave the world with the kalima. La ilaha illallah. There is no God worthy of worship but Allah. O oh, Khabbab, don't be hasty. Make sabr. The help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will definitely come. With iman will come test. With Iman will come trial. Allah has always tested the believers. Allah is testing the believers and Allah will test the believers right till the day of judgment. My young friends, look at the Anbiya Ali Salatu Wasalam. The Anbiya Ali Salatu Wasalam were not spared. Who are the Anbiya? They're the chosen ones. They're the near ones. They are the dear ones. You and I would think, surely these people that Allah has chosen Himself, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves, Allah will not put them through you know, difficulties and calamities. Yet my young friends, the more dear and near you are to Allah, the more Allah tests you, the more Allah rinses you, the more Allah squeezes you. Look at Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam. Who from amongst us here in this gathering has not heard the story of Ayyub? We've been hearing it as children, my young friends, how Allah showered Sayyidina Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam with blessings, countless blessings. And then Allah took away his blessings one by one. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took away his children. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala afflicted him with illness as a result of which people left him. He was the Nabi of Allah. Look at Azat Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam, my young friends. 950 years Azat Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam conveyed the message of Allah. Inni da'udu qawmi laylu wa nahara. فَلَمْ يَزِدْهُمْ دُعَيْ إِلَّا فِرَارًا He would invite them by day. He would invite them by night. And they would respond by insulting him, by calling him Majnoon, that he's a madman. They used to laugh at him. They used to insult him. They used to belittle him, my young friends. They used to beat him. This is what he received for 950 years, my young friends. This was the test of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You and I top, top. Majority of us 
you know, that, that live in this dunya at this moment in time. Their life is how long? 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, 8 years. That's as far as it goes. So our calamity and difficulty, top end will be 70, 80, 90 years. And here you have the Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For 950 years, he went through this difficulty, my young friends. My young friends. And then you have our beloved Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Habib of Allah. There is no one in rank higher than the Habib of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no rank higher than the rank of the Habib, the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my young friends. Yeah? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, second to the Almighty Allah, leader of the former, leader of the latter. Look at the difficulty that the Habib of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala went through. From the moment he declared the kalima, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, my young friends, they pounced upon him. They pounce upon him. Yeah. The Arabs of the Jahiliyyah, the Quraysh of Mecca, pounce upon Rasulullah, and it begins with verbal persecution. They say, Sahir, he's a magician. Sha'ir, he is a poet. Asatir al awwalin these are just jackanories. Majnoon, he is insane. Na'udhu billah, he is a madman. This is how they would insult Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa He's a kahin, he's a soothsayer, he's a fortune teller. From verbal persecution, it doesn't stop. This is just the beginning, my young friends. The persecution intensifies. From verbal persecution to physical persecution, my young friends. Nabi uh, Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa they would belittle him. They would take dust and dirt and they would cover the blessed body of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, belittling him, insulting him, my young friends. And when the Nabi of Allah would return home, and as a Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha would see what they have done to her blessed father, she would rush to the Nabi of Allah with tears flowing from her eyes. She would wipe away the dust and dirt from the blessed body of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And our beloved Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would console her, would embrace her. Ya Fatima, la tabki fa inna Allah manyun abak. Oh Fatima, do not cry. Allah will protect your father. Allah will look after your father. My young friends, the persecution intensifies. Even when he stood before the Almighty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in prayer, they will not allow the Nabi of Allah to pray in peace. They will not allow the Nabi of Allah to pray in peace. When he would bow down in sajda, my young friends, they would take impurity, they would take najasat, they would take filth, they would take the fetus of an animal and they would place it on the blessed back of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as a result of this impurity, the Nabi of Allah would not be able to raise his head from sajda and he would remain in sajda. And it was only when his daughter would realize what they have done to her blessed father, she would rush and she would come and she would re remove this impurity from the blessed back of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a result of which the Nabi of Allah would be able to raise his head from sajda. I ask you, my young friends, what happened in Taif? Who can forget what happened in Taif? Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam experience at the hands of the people of Taif what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't experience in his entire life. Alanki, he went to Taif. Why? He went to Taif with a good intention. He went to Taif to invite them to the kalima La ilaha illallah. Give the people of Taif the keys to paradise to make them the owners and malik of paradise. This is why the Nabi of Allah went to paradise, went to Taif. And how did the people of Taif receive the Nabi of Allah? They set the street urchins against him, the young local gangsters against him. And they came and stood on the other side of the road. And Rasulullah was leaving. They showered him with stones. stones Stones are hitting every inch of the blessed body of Rasulullah from his hands to his legs. My young friends, so much blood, he's covered in blood that Rasulullah can barely walk. And it's with this difficulty that Nabi of Allah leaves Taif. And when he leaves Taif, he so hurt that he raises his hand and begs for Allah's mercy and makes a dua. Allahumma ilayka ashku du'fa kuwati wa qillata hilati wa huwani ala nas ya arham al-rahimin. Anta rabbu al-musra'afeen. Anta rabbi ila man takilni ila ba'idin yatajah. He's begging for Allah's mercy. And even then, my young friends, he wasn't blaming the people of Taif. He was saying to Allah, oh Allah, I'm complaining about my weakness. Oh Allah, it's not the fault of the people of Taif. It's the fault of Muhammad. Oh Allah, maybe it's me. It's me that I'm insignificant. Maybe I don't know how to convey the message of Allah. As a result, I, as a result, I was received in the manner that I was received. It doesn't come to an end. The persecution intensifies. So much so now, 
Yeah. The likes of Bilal and others are forced to migrate to Habasha, not once but twice. The persecution doesn't come to an end. It intensifies. So much so, my young friends. Now the Nabi of Allah is forced to migrate from Makkah al Makarrama to Madinah al Munawwara. You'd think now they will leave the Nabi of Allah. No, my young friends. As he leaves from Makkah to Madinah, they set up, they, 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 they set people to follow him, to find him, to bring back his head, and they put up a nam. You know, they were prepared to give, um, you know, uh, a reward for whoever ever brought back the head of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam or the body of Nabi of Allah Nabi Karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam gets to Madina al munawwara you think now they will leave him no my young friends a year after a thousand strong come is the battle of Badr on one hand you have a thousand strong with their war horses and their camels and their and their and their and their shields and their swords and then you have a mere 313 believers as i mentioned some of them don't even have two sheets to cover their bodies some of them don't even have shoes some of them are carrying broken sticks and spades and the Nabi of Allah is making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tears are flowing from his eyes he spent the entire night worshiping Allah and he's saying to Allah Allahumma innahum jiya'un fashbi'hum oh Allah they're hungry I beg you feed them feed them innahum hufatun fahmilhum oh Allah they're barefooted oh Allah mount them innahum uratun faksuhum oh Allah they're naked clothe them oh Allah he's crying so much and he's begging Allah so much that he's saying oh Allah Allahumma in tuhlat hadhi al-isaba la tu'bad oh Allah if this group of believers is destroyed today, then you will never be worshipped right till the day of judgment. He's crying so much that Sayyidina Abu Bakr clings onto the Nabi of Allah and says, Ya Rasulullah, enough is enough. You've asked Allah too much. Allah will not disgrace you. Allah will take care of you. Allah will take care of your Ummah. My young friends, the persecution doesn't come to an end. A year after now is the battle of Uhud. On one side, you have a mere 700. There was a thousand. 300 hypocrites went before the battle even began, leaving 700 around people. And on the other side, you have 3,000 kuffar again with all the weapons and in this battle momentarily they got the upper hand of the believers as a result of which Rasulullah's tooth Mubarak is shaheed and blood is flowing from the face of Rasulullah and he's making dua Allahumma ghfir li qawmi fa innum la ya'lamun oh Allah I beg you forgive my people for they know not forgive my people for they know not and then my young friends, they mutilate the body of Sayyidina Hamza radiallahu ta'ala an. And Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam feels so much pain that Jibra'il Amin is sent from the heavens to console the Nabi of Allah. Oh Jibra'il, tell Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that I've written on the arsh of Allah that Hamza is the lion of Allah. And only then did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam feel at ease and peace inside his heart. It doesn't come to an end. Two years pass, my young friends. And now the whole of Arabia unites against the Nabi of Allah. Unites against the Nabi of Allah is Ghazwatul Ahzab. Rasulullah consults the Sahaba, what should we do? All the Arabs have united. Sayyidina Salman al Farsi radiallahu ta'ala explains. He was well acquainted with Persian warfare. He was Persian by Asal and so dear to the Nabi of Allah that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would say with regards to him, Salman minna ahl al bayt. Salman is from amongst the household of the Nabi of Allah. Sayyidina Salman said, Ya Rasulullah, in Persia, in circumstances like this, we would, re- we would dig trenches. So the Nabi of Allah now with the believers is digging a trench. And the halat of the believers is such, due to hunger is bitterly cold. Bitterly cold. Who is unaware? For those that you have been blessed with the ziyarah of Madina to Munawwara, know how cold and bitter it gets within the, the cold months. It's the bitter cold of Madina to Munawwara. And the hunger is at such level that the Sahaba, because of hunger, have a stone tied to their stomach. And in this condition, they're digging this trench. And when this is a condition of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala ajma'in, my young friends, the Habib of Allah has two stones tied to his stomach to ease the pain of hunger. And in this condition, the Nabi of Allah himself with his blessed hands is participating in digging the trench. They're digging the trench from one side because there's enemy there. And now within Madinah to Munawwara, my young friends, the Yahud are causing problems. The Munafikeen are causing problems. The men are busy digging the trench. They want to loot their houses, plunder their houses, what do you call it, um, take advantage of their women. This is what they're trying to do, my young friends. Persecution upon persecution from the moment he declared the kalima la ilaha illallah till Makkah was conquered in the eighth year of Hijrah. And who am I talking about? None other than the Habib of Allah. This is the person for whom this dunya, this universe was created. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested the Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So where will you and I, what are we in comparison to the Habib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Nothing my young friends. We're not even worthy of mention. 
If Allah didn't spare the likes of Nuh to Ayyub, to Ibrahim, to Ibrahim, Allahu Akbar. How many times Allah tested him? How many times Allah tested him? From the fire to sacrificing his own child. Yeah. Allah put him through this. Where will you and I have an easy, cozy life? Where we just wake up, enjoy, and then leave this world and go straight to paradise. With Iman will always be test and trial and there will be difficulty. And why does Allah do it? My young friends, Allah says in the Quran, Simple. To test who from amongst us is truthful and who amongst us is a liar. It is only at the time of trust you see the reality of people. How many friends you've got on your mobile phone? Each one of you are on five, six WhatsApp groups, 250 in each group. You've got thousands just on your phone. But in reality, how many friends do you actually have out of them? And you'll see this at the time of your need, how many friends you've actually got. And at the time of your need, my young friends, you'll realize you have nothing. And the only people that will help you are those that have a blood connection with you. You need some money, go ask your friend. You'll see how many friends that you have. You're moving houses, go through your mobile phone. Let's see how many turn up. It's at the time of test, you'll see the reality of people. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing us. Everyone on a good day says, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. There is no God worthy of worship Allah. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. And we all claim we love Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa Will you still say, La ilaha illallah when Allah takes away some of your morsels? Takes away some of your food? When Allah takes away some of your wealth? When Allah takes away some of your children? When Allah takes away your wife, when Allah takes away your mother and father, will you still say, لَن يُسِيبَنَا إِلَّا مَا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَنَا Will you still say, وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكَّلِ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ No, we're happy with what Allah has decided. And we rely upon Allah. Will you still say this? This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us. Now the second point that I want to make a mention before I conclude my young friends is that majority of us, you know when it comes to this global situation of the believers, you know all this suffering, Majority of us cannot see beyond this suffering. Majority of us cannot see the wisdom of Allah. We can't comprehend the wisdom of Allah. What Allah does, why Allah does it. Allah is far and beyond. Where are we going to comprehend Allah? Where are we going to comprehend the wisdom of Allah? Where are we going to comprehend the doings of Allah? لا يسأل أما يفعل Allah does as He pleases. That's what's part of being a khuda. I mean, a God, a creator, you do as you please. La yus'al amma yaf'al. Wam yus'alun. He's not questioned. He does as he pleases. He never wrongs anyone. Wa ma rabbuka bizallamin lil abid. Majority of us cannot see beyond the suffering. We can't see the good that's coming out of what is happening at this moment in time. Yeah. Because this is our understanding. This is our criteria. You know, for you and I, this is our understanding. Good can only come from something that is good. Good cannot come from something that is not good. This is our understanding. This is the way our mind works. If something is good, you can get good from it. But if there's no good, you can't get good from it. Yet if you look at the Quran, my young friends, yeah, everything will come to perfect light. Allah says in the Quran, yeah, and look how these verses apply. You know, the Quran amazes me. فَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ وَعَسَىٰ أَن تُحِبُّ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ شَرٌ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ How this verse applied to, to, to the reason why it was revealed? How this verse has been applied for the last 1400 years? And how this verse applies to this very day? This is the miraculous aspect of the Quran. Allah says, you may dislike something. Yet the very thing that you dislike, for you, there's goodness in it. There's benefit in it. And sometimes you like something, yet in that thing that you like, there's no benefit in it. There's harm in it. There's shar in it. There's evil in it. How truthful Allah is. My young friends, many a time, there will be something that you disliked. Yet afterwards you realize, you know what? That very thing that you disliked, there was goodness in it for you. You lost your job. You didn't like it. Yeah? So this is something that you disliked. 
You used to work 40 hour week and only get 200 pounds. Yeah. You didn't like it. A few months pass, you got yourself another job. Now this job, you're only working 20 hours, no pressure, a lot easier than the first, and you're earning 500 pounds. The very thing that you disliked, Allah placed goodness in it for you. Because had you not lost that job, you wouldn't have got another job. Give you another example. You've got cancer in your leg. So the doctor tells you, bye, I need to amputate. You go crazy, no way, <coughs> I'm going to lose my leg. Now, who would like that? Nobody would like to lose his leg. Yet, look, the very thing that you dislike, goodness for you is in that very thing. Because if you don't amputate your leg, allow the doctor to cut your leg off, your cancer will spread to your thigh, it will spread to your organs, and you will die. So your survival, which is far greater than, you know, holding on to a limb, yeah, lies in what? In the amputation. A story comes to mind, a sahabi broke his foot. Naturally, he, wasn't, he, he was displeased, he didn't like it. Yet goodness and Allah's rahmat mercy was in that very thing, the sahabi losing his foot. You're thinking, how can that be, yeah? Yeah? Let me explain. When the differences arose between Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala and Sayyidina Muawiyah, yeah, and there were people that followed Ali and there were people that followed Sayyidina Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, and there were people recruiting on behalf of Ali and there were people recruiting on behalf of Muawiyah. Yeah? They would approach him. People of Ali would say, you know, Ali is going to come and fight for Sayyidina Ali. And people would approach him from Sayyidina Muawiyah's side, no, Sayyidina Muawiyah is going to come and approach him. They come and fight on behalf of Sayyidina Muawiyah. And he would turn around and say to them, never mind fight, I can't even walk. And then he would raise his hands and thank Allah and say, Alhamdulillahilladhi tahara yadi min hadhihi dima bi idhabi rijli. All praise to Allah that has kept my hand pure from this bloodshed that I'm not involved. Sahaba fighting, I'm not involved. Yeah? Allah has kept my hand pure from this bloodshed. And how did Allah do it? Bi izhabi rijli. By taking away my foot. I can't even walk. So that way no one can even do my mulamat and blame me that I'm not participating in this battle. Yeah. Give you another example. A miscarriage. A woman losing a child. Who would like that? You know, you're carrying this child. One month passes, two months passes, three months passes. And all of a sudden, that woman loses that child. She's so careful. How difficult it must be for that mother losing that child. Yeah. Nobody would like that. But look at the goodness Allah has even placed in this. And when will you see this goodness? You'll see it on the day of judgment on the plane of resurrection. When this same child, Sikh, they call it in Arabic, this child which is miscarriaged, you call it in Arabic Sikh, Narkis child, which one wasn't formed fully. <coughs> this child on the day of judgment will do zid with Allah. Can you imagine? He will argue with Allah. On the plane of resurrection, my young friends, when I've just mentioned what the Anbiya's response will be, Anbiya will say what? Inna Rabbi kal ghadibal yawma ghadban. Allah is angry today, we can't go near Allah. Allah has never been angry like this before. Allah will never be angry like this again. We can't approach Allah. But Allah says, Mada ujibtum? On the day of judgment, when Allah will ask the Anbiya, what was your response? Yeah. Allah will ask, no, what was your response? I sent you to convey the message, to invite the people to the La ilaha illallah. What was your response? What did the people say to you? Now, Nu was there. He knows who believed, and he knows who didn't believe. In spite of this, my young friends, the fear will be such on that day, that the Anbiya alayhi salatu wa salam will say, La ilma lana inna ka inta allam al ghayyub. Oh Allah, we possess no knowledge. You are the knower of all things. On that day, when Allah will be angry like never before, and the Anbiya alayhi salatu wa salam will be afraid to approach Allah, how will this child have courage to argue with Allah on the plane of resurrection? That Allah will address this child with these words. This is how Allah will address this child. You know why he'll have the courage to do zid with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day? He never came in the dunya. 
So he doesn't know who Allah is. He never came in the dunya. Nobody taught him about Allah. He doesn't know who Allah is. And when you don't know Allah, you're not afraid of Allah. Look, a child is not afraid of a snake. Why is he not afraid of a snake? Because he doesn't know that it can bite and it can kill him. But as soon as that snake bites, believe me, that child will never go near a snake. He doesn't know the value of a snake. Likewise, this child never had the opportunity to come in this dunya. He didn't know what Allah was. So that's why he will make zid with Allah on the plane of resurrection. And when Allah says, go to paradise, he says, no Allah, I'm not going to go till you take my mother out of Jahannam and send her with me. And he'll stay there. And Allah will address the child. Go on. Oh, miscarried child, narcis child. Hold your mother with your umbilical cord. With the umbilical cord, cord, hold your mother and take her inside paradise. So the very thing that you dislike, look how much khair Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed inside it. I'm just going to give you one example and I'm going to conclude. And this example is of the time of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala jma'in, where the Sahaba were going through a very difficult patch. Just like we're going through a very difficult patch. You know, at this moment in time, all our youngsters are always you know, asking these questions. We're on the haq. Why are we being humiliated? As Muslims, why are we being defeated? Yeah. So the example that comes to mind was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw a dream. He saw a dream that he went to Makkah and he performed tawaf. Now when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa related this dream to the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala al-Majma'een, the Muhajireen especially were overwhelmed, happy. Because it's been years since they've migrated, forced to leave their properties and everything. And they migrated to, you know, Madinah to Manawara. You know, they always yearn to see, go back to uh, Mecca and see the house of Allah and perform tawaf. But there was never an opportunity. The kuffar always had the upper hand. So when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa narrated this dream, six year of hujrah, 1400 sahaba, around 1400 sahaba go ready with the Nabi of Allah wearing two sheets of cloth, a haram. They had with, their, with them their sacrificial animals. No weapons of war to so the Quraysh know that the Nabi of Allah has come with good intentions and not to fight. He's come for Umrah. And they leave with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Now Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa comes and comes to a place called Hudaybiyah. At the same time, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa had sent a spy ahead to see the reaction of the Quraysh. Now this spy came back and told the Nabi of Allah that the Quraysh have put on their war gear and they've took an oath that they will never let Muhammad enter Makkah al Mukarramah. Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam proceeds to Makkah. All of a sudden his she camel sits down. The Sahaba say, some Sahaba said, Khala'ati al-Qaswa, Khala'ati al-Qaswa. That the she camel refuses to get up. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, no bai. It's not that the she camel refuses to get up. That's not the nature of this she camel. The very being Allah that restrained the elephants from entering Makkah is stopping this she camel from entering Makkah. That's why it doesn't get up. Then my young friends, Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent Khirash bin Umayya, go meet the Quraysh. Tell them, we've not come to fight, we've come for Umrah. He goes, he narrowly escapes. They kill his camel, he comes back, just managed to save his life. Now, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent Usmani Ghani. Usmani Ghani goes, conveys the message of Allah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he, uh, to the Quraysh that, you know, this is why we've come. So the Quraysh say to him, okay, if you want to make tawaf, fine. But under no circumstance will we allow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to make tawaf. What will the Arabs think? What will the tribes think that he's compelled us, he's forced us to allow him to enter Mecca under no circumstance, never. Now, negotiations are taken between Usman and the Quraysh, and these negotiations, negotiations are going on for so long that a rumor reaches the Nabi of Allah and the believers that they've killed Usman. So the believers, even though they didn't come to fight, they had no weapons, they're wearing sheets of cloth, humble attire, no war horses, no war camels, Every single one of them makes bay'ah with Rasulullah, pledge allegiance. That Ya Rasulullah, we will fight till death. We will fight till our last breath. We will take the revenge of Usman. When the Quraysh hear that the Muslims have pledged allegiance, that they will fight for death, my young friends, they sent people for negotiations. I'm quoting the story short. The last person that they sent was a man called Suhail ibn Amr. Suhail ibn Amr, this, this was the, some of the, some of the uh, things that they, uh, they agreed upon. One thing that they agreed upon was that the Muslims and non-Muslims will not fight anymore. For 10 years there will be truce, there will be peace. Another point was that the Muslims this year cannot perform Umrah. 
they will have to go back. They will come the following year, only stay for three days, perform Umrah, and they will have to go back. Another condition, any Muslim that leaves Mecca to go to Medina, the Muslims will have to send him back to Mecca. But any Muslim that goes from Medina to Mecca, the Quraysh of Mecca will not send him back to Rasulullah So all these conditions were going against the believers. And the believers were disheartened and saddened, just like we're disheartened and saddened today. They couldn't understand as to why the Nabi of Allah was agreeing to all their terms and conditions. Why was he agreeing? They couldn't understand it. And what made it even more difficult for them when they were writing this peace treaty, the kuffar insulted the Nabi of Allah. They made him omit the words, Muhammadur Rasulullah. And they also made him omit the words, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim And the Muslims were fuming. What made it even more difficult for them was, whilst this treaty was being written, or had just been written, a Muslim by the name of Abu Jundal came, appeared in chains. He just escaped Mecca, and he's appearing in Hudaybiyah, where the Nabi of Allah is in chains before the Nabi of Allah. Now Suhail, on behalf of the Kuffar, says to the Nabi of Allah, look at the condition, that any Muslim that comes from Mecca, you will send him back, send him back. Nabi Karim wasallam agrees. Suhail, Abu, uh, Abu Jundal says to the believers, O Muslimano, I came to you as a Muslim. He's been persecuted and tortured by the non-believers. He says to the Muslims, I came to you as a Muslim, and you're sending me back to these people. Do you not see what they have done to me and are doing to me? And Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam consoles him. Isbir wahtasib. Be patient. Fa'inna la naghdir. We're believers. We don't break our promises. We don't go against our, tre- uh, our agreements. Make sabr, Allah will, take it easy. Allah will make it easy for you, Allah will make a way out for you. My young friends, the Muslims were so disheartened that the likes of Umar Farooq, who? Umar Farooq, Farooq, man farraka bayn al haqq wal batil, the one that would distinguish between right and wrong, haqq and batil, iman and kufr. The one the Prophet said, Law kana ba'di nabiyun la kana Umar, if there was ever a prophet to come after me, then this Prophet would be none other than Sayyidina Umar Farooq radiallahu ta'ala. What he would say, the Qur'an would be revealed in accordance. How many muwafaqati Umar they are. This is who I'm talking about. Muslims were so down, my young friends, as a result of all this situation. Just like we're down at this moment in time. The Umar Farooq are of all people approached the Nabi of Allah. And this is what he said to the Nabi of Allah. This is what he said to the Nabi of Allah. He said, Alasta Nabi Allahi Haqqa. Are you not the true Prophet of Allah? And Rasulullah said, Bala, O Umar, indeed I am the true Prophet of Allah. Umar is asking the Nabi of Allah, Are you not the true Prophet of Allah? And Rasulullah is responding, Bala. Then Umar asked, Alasna al al Haqq wa aduwana al al Batil. Ya Rasulullah, are we not on the Haqq? And our enemy in the wrong, in error, on batil. Are we not right and they're wrong? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Umar, bala indeed. We are on haqq and they are on batil. And then Umar asked the Nabi of Allah, then tell me, Ya Rasulullah, Allah, why is it that time after time we are being humiliated and we are being disgraced? And Rasulullah ﷺ stayed strong, strong and firm. And said to Umar, O oh Umar, Ana Abdullahi wa Rasuluhu. I am the servant of Allah and I am the messenger of Allah. I have yaqeen in this. Walastu'a'si. Yeah. I don't make haste and I don't disobey Allah. Wa huwa nasiri. And I have yaqeen that Allah will help me and Allah will not allow Muhammad and Islam and the Muslims to perish. My young friends, what do you think was the frame of mind of Umar and the believers? That after this, after speaking with the Nabi of Allah, my young friends, he went to Abu Bakr and asked exactly the same questions. He received his response from the Nabi of Allah, my young friends. What state of mind do you think he was at the time? Or what do you think the halat were like at the time? 
and how sad do you think the believers was? That after this he went to Abu Bakr and asked, Abu Bakr, is he not the true prophet of Allah? And Abu Bakr said, indeed. Oh Abu Bakr, are we not on haq and they on batil? And Abu Bakr said, indeed, we are on haq and they on batil. Oh Abu Bakr, then why are we being humiliated and disgraced? And Abu Bakr said, Oh Umar, he is a servant of Allah. He is the messenger of Allah. He will not disobey of Allah. He will not disobey Allah. And Allah will help him. Allah will not allow the believers to perish. Umar said, Oh Abu Bakr, did he not tell us that we were going to make tawaf? Abu Bakr said, Indeed, O oh Umar, but did he tell you that you were going to do it this year? No, he didn't tell you that you were going to do it this year. He just said that you were going to do it. My young friends, the treaty has been written. After this, the Nabi of Allah tells the Sahaba to take off your ihrams. Sacrifice your animals, become halal. Yeah. Their situation was such, my young friends, that when the Nabi of Allah made this announcement, not one stood up. Who are we talking about here? You know, the very people that when he would do just ishara, they would lay down their lives for him. This is how much love they had for him. But it was a very difficult, sanguine moment for the believers. Very difficult times. Very down. Yeah. That Rasulullah mentioned it a second time. Nobody got up. He mentioned it a third time. Nobody got up. It was only after the Nabi of Allah took off his ihram and sacrificed his animal. Did the Sahaba then, following in the footsteps of Rasulullah do exactly the same. Now the believers are returning. Yeah. From Mecca to Medina. Not having performed tawaf. Yeah, the, the surah Zahiran looks of, a, 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 you know, of humiliation and defeat. They're returning to Medina and Allah reveals the verse of the Quran. Inna Allah is telling the Nabi of Allah that you know this setback in Hudaybiyah, this is not a setback. This is not a setback. This is victory for you and the believers. My question to you is, how can it be a victory? Because you see, this is what the Sahaba saw. The Sahaba saw humiliation and defeat. Because they came for what? Umrah. Mentally, physically prepared. They're so close to Makkah, Tullam, Karama, just on the outskirts of Makkah. And they've been forced to leave Makkah and go back and take off their ihrams. So it's a situation of humiliation and Defeat. And Allah's calling it a victory. How can it be a victory? This, my young friends, is an example of that verse of the Quran. That you may dislike something, yet the very thing that you dislike, Allah's placed goodness in it for you. It's a source of mercy for you. It's a source of blessing for you. Yeah? All the Sahaba disliked this because of what they could see. And what they could see was humiliation and defeat. But what they couldn't see and what you and I can't see today, and that's why sometimes we mourn and we groan and we get disheartened, what we can't see is the great plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we can't see and what the Sahaba couldn't see was the wisdom of Allah and the conquest that Allah had placed inside the truce. The Quran said it was a victory. And how truthful the Quran is. Because when you study Islamic history, you will realize and come to this conclusion. Indeed, this peace treaty was a victory. Because this is, what, this is the thing that was a means for the victory in Khaybar and for the victory in Makkah al Makarramah and Makkah was conquered. How? Let me tell you. Before this peace treaty, there was always war. There was no opportunity for dialogue. You know, speaking with the non-believers, interacting with them, talking to them. You know, Muslims were a minority. When they used to pray, they used to pray secretly inside their houses and so forth. When they signed this peace treaty now, no war for 10 years that both parties have agreed. Muslims are openly praying, giving zakat, fasting, donating, buying and selling speaking with the non-believers, interacting, doing business with them. And now the non-believers are seeing Muslims firsthand. They're not listening to their elders, the Ru'usai of Makkah, the chiefs of the Quraysh. They're actually dealing and willing with them. And they're thinking, you know what? These people are not like what people say. 
This is a beautiful deen. When they saw their akhlaq, their adab, you know, their character, their mercy, their compassion, their love, the way they would receive people, the way they would deal with people, they began to declare the kalima, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. How many do you think declare the kalima, La ilaha illallah? Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri says, from within two years of the truce, two years of the truce of Hudaybiyah, more people embrace Islam within these two years than 16 years before it. And you can see this by the fact when Rasulullah went for Umrah, how many people did he have with him I mentioned? Around 1400. Two years after when he went to conquer Makkah, he had an army of 10,000 men. Where did they come from? This is why Allah said, Inna fatahana laka fatham mubina. Just as that humiliation and defeat Allah turned into victory, there was victory hidden within it. The Sahaba couldn't see it. I have yaqeen in Allah, the Arhamul Rahimin, the Akramul Akrameen. There is no more, there is no being more merciful than Allah. This is why when he begins his Quran, he introduces himself. How? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. This is how he introduces himself, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. He's too merciful yeah, to allow, you know, this blood, yeah, which is, you know, how much blood has been shed? We're not talking about hundreds, we're not talking about thousands. You know, if I were to say millions, it wouldn't be an exaggeration. Allah is too merciful to allow blood of innocent believers to go to waste. Allah is too merciful. Yeah. What Allah has planned, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Yeah. And Allah is the best of planners. We are just hasty. That's our problem. My young friends, so much good has already come out of this situation. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best how much more good will come. Let me give you one or two examples and I'll conclude. Look at all the innocent Muslims that have been killed. And that are being killed. Whether it's in Sham, whether it's in Rohingya, wherever it may be. Yeah. Whether it's through bombs, drones, whatever it may be. Innocent Muslims that are being killed around the globe. By the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my young friends, Every single one of these Muslimin is dying as a shaheed. He's dying as a martyr. Not only is he dying as a martyr, the Jannah of Allah awaits him, inshallah. What more can anyone ask for more than this? Leaving the world as a shaheed, acquiring the pleasure of Allah, and hoping the Jannah of Allah, insha'Allah, will be awaiting us. What can you ask for more than this? This is how they're leaving this world. You and I, who Allah is blessed with afia, and Allah continue to bless us with afia, because you and I, my young friends, you know, our material is not such that we can tolerate even one billionth of what our Muslim brothers are tolerating in the blessed land of Sham. We can't tolerate it. So Allah keep us with afia. You know, people like yourself and myself, how will we die? What? With a glass of vodka in our hands? Dancing in some nightclub? Committing some haram? Who knows? What good is this life that you and I live? A life of a hundred years, maxim, top end, if you get that far. A life in which you're living, fulfilling your desires, intoxicated with the dunya, whining, dining, liming, chilling, calling, whatever you like, committing haram by day and by night. What good is this life of a hundred years? Yeah, where you haven't been tested, no calamity, no difficulties. Yeah, you leave this world not having acquired the pleasure of Allah and your end result is that you burn in Jahannam forever 
and ever Allah knows best. What good is that life? My young friends, you know all the people that have ever suffered, that are suffering, and that will suffer from amongst the believers right till the day of judgment. You know all their suffering to one side. Yeah? And the suffering of a Jahannami in Jahannam for one minute. Yeah? That suffering of the Jahannami in Jahannam for one minute will outweigh the suffering of all the believers of all times from the first man till the last man. And you'll see this, don't take my word for it. You will see this when you leave this world. So don't you think my young friends, we don't ask Allah for difficulty because we're not difficulty material. You always ask Allah. This is the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Always ask Allah for aviyah, good health, Allah keep you well. Safe and free from difficulties. But my young friends, don't you think a life where Allah just touches you a little bit, a bit of difficulty, and even that difficulty is nothing in comparison to the difficulties of Akhirah. You know, that life, whether it's five years or ten years, whatever it may be, yeah, in which you acquire the pleasure of Allah and then you're roaming in Jannah forever and ever and ever, receiving blessings that the lowest blessing of Jannah, yeah, will outdo any blessing in the dunya. Don't you think that life is far better? Looking at it from this perspective, yeah, the people in Sham are blessed. And though all those others that are dying, yeah, in this, there's blessing for them. Yeah. For those that are not dying like this, that have just been injured, let's say for example, his hands been blown off, or his legs been blown off, then what about those people? These people, my young friends, Prophet Wasallam said, Inna rajul Listen very carefully to this. It's a very beautiful hadith. All the hadiths of Rasulullah are beautiful. That sometimes Allah wants to say, let's say, give Abdullah a very high status and a particular rank, elevated status in paradise. But when you look at Abdullah, Abdullah hasn't done deeds in the dunya worthy of this high maqam which Allah has reserved for him. So what does the Arham al-Rahimin do? Allah tests him in the dunya. Puts him through these difficulties. Takes away his arm, takes away his child, takes away his mother, or he may have had a car crash, whatever it may be. Allah puts him through these difficulties and Abdullah does sabr as a result of which then he becomes worthy of that high rank which Allah has reserved for him in the Akhirah. So these people, it's so possible that many of them, Allah is putting them through these difficulties because Allah wants to give them this high maqam. And you know, these high maqam, elevated status will be so high in the Akhirah that you know, people like yourself and myself, when we meet Allah on the day of judgment, you know what we'll say to Allah? When we see what Allah gives them, we'll envy them. And we'll say, Allah, Ya Layta Juludana Quridat Bil Maqarid. Oh Allah, only if our skins were also cut with scissors and we went through difficulties, so today we would also receive what our Muslim brethren have received. And for, though, and for some people, my young friends, it won't be about elevated ranks, it will be about purification. Allah's purifying them, Allah's making a means for their sins to be forgiven. This is how merciful Allah is. Prophet Sallallahu said, مَا يُصِيبُ الْمُؤْمِنْ مِنْ نَصَبْ وَلَا وَصَبْ وَلَا حَمْ وَلَا حُزَنْ وَلَا غَمْ وَلَا أَذَنْ حَتَّى الشَّوْكَ يُشَاكَهَا إِلَّا كَفَّرَ اللَّهُ بِهَا خَطَايَا Any difficulty a Muslim experiences, and I'm not talking about big difficulties here. Yeah. Any difficulty, even if it's minute, small. How small? Look guys, you've been sitting here now for so long. So naturally you're tired. It's a difficulty. Some of you may even be sweating because it's hot here. It's a difficulty. You know, even that will be weighed in your mizan on the day of judgment. Even because of that, Allah will wipe away your sin. So much so, my young friends, that these type of people will come to Allah on the day of judgment because they went through so much difficulty, they'll come on the day of judgment. 
and they're free and pure from sin. So it's a mercy. We can't see. We can't see all this. Look other than this. Yeah. Look at the good that's coming out of this. By the grace of Allah. Look. Thousands and thousands of people are making ruju to Allah. Muslims around the globe. And I'm talking about young individuals like myself, yourself, that were intoxicated you know, with this dunya. Yeah, this dunya got too much of them. Yeah. They, all they did was whine and dine and you know, uh, chill out with their mates and go out on a Saturday night and you know, do the do. Yeah. Hundreds in their thousands are making ruju to Allah, turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, beautifying their lives, made tawbah to Allah, beautifying their lives now with the teachings of Allah and His Rasul because of all this Islamophobia. They're realizing who they are. They're waking up from their sleep and they're turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something that you and I could not do even in a hundred years. You know, if a million of us got together, we couldn't have achieved this outcome, what this situation has brought about. I'll give you an example. You know, sometimes, you know, you invite your friend. You're on track, but your friend's not on track. And how many will, of us will have friends like this? Yeah, you want good for him and you want to invite him to the, you know, to the deen of Allah. Okay, pray, he's not praying. Other than that, he's a great guy, but he doesn't pray. He doesn't do these type of things. And he's always out enjoying himself. And you invite him, but he doesn't listen. Yeah, you invite him again. He doesn't listen. You ask him to come for namaz, he'll always make an excuse. And you've done this hundreds and thousands of times and you've done it for years. Yeah. And you're losing hope, you think, you know what? I'll never be able to get through to this guy. He's absolutely a beautiful guy, but he doesn't want to embrace the deen, you need to practice the deen. How many of us will have friends like this? But then, you know, all of a sudden, the same guy, something will happen to him. He's involved in a car crash. Oh, you know what? His best mate just died. Something will happen in his life. A circumstance will come about. All of a sudden, the same guy which you spent 20 years inviting, making effort on, and he would never listen. This one thing has happened in his life. All of a sudden, my young friends, now he doesn't even get up from, uh, from prostration. And day and night, he's just worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's that halat, you know, the circumstance. You know, that's brought about that change. And by the grace of Allah, you know, these halat that the Muslims are going through at this moment in time. Many of us were just, you know, heedless of Allah and His Rasul, not interested in the deen. Now all of a sudden, you know, when everyone's having a go at the Muslims around the globe, you've started questioning your identity, Kibai, hold on. That's me they're talking about. Let me look into my deen. And you've started looking in your deen. And by the grace of Allah, thousands of youngsters, there's many in England that I know, you no, know, lads that were just on the street. That by the grace of Allah, now because you know the halal that are happening in Syria, mashallah, they're doing all this charity work. And they're doing so much good. And they're involving a lot of the boys from the street in this good. So look at, you know, the halal yeah, has become a means of mercy. You know, for these individuals. You know, sometimes you've got a, a child that's not able, yeah, in your house. He's got some, what do you call it, weakness. Yeah. That one child... Look how much of a source of blessing he is. Yeah? That one child becomes a means of paradise, not just for every member of that family, but everyone that ever helped him. You've got a child in your house that's not able. So, Zairbata, you show shafqat, muhabbat, rahmat. Yeah? You go out of your way to help him, to, 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 to smile at him. Yeah? All that has been weighed in your ajr. How do you not have that child? You wouldn't do that. So Allah makes that one child a means of blessing for millions of others. So this hala that we're going through at this moment in time, it may be difficult for some, but alhamdulillah, they're not being deprived. But at the same time, it's a means of blessing for thousands and thousands of people. A final thing, another good that's coming out of this. The message of Islam by the grace of Allah has been conveyed to every corner of the globe. In this day and age, you know, if all of us got together, the thousands of us, we could not have conveyed the message as it's been conveyed today. And who's done this? The media. The media has conveyed the message of Islam in every corner of the globe. Wherever there is a TV, whether it's in the Amazon basin or the Kalahari bush in Africa. Yeah? Every single person that has this box, this satellite or whatever it may be, he is now aware of Islam. He's now aware of Muslims, he's aware of the Quran, and he's aware of Muhammad. 
Around the globe, it's the most discussed subject. And I'm not talking about whether it's positive or negative. Even I know it's negative. Yeah. But my young friends, before you embrace something, you have to talk about it. Before you embrace something, you have to be aware of the thing. You have to be conscious of it. And today, by the grace of Allah, every non-believer is conscious of Islam. He knows about Islam. It may be, it may be, it may be that what he knows is negative. Yeah? But Alhamdulillah, he's heard about Islam. He's talking about Islam. He's talking about Muslims. He's talking about the Quran. Yeah? So it's in his heart and mind. Yeah, it's on, it, it, sorry, it's on his heart and tongue. At this moment in time, it's negative. It's on his heart and tongue. Tomorrow, inshallah, it will be positive and it will be inside his heart. And he will utter, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Look at the research. How many people after 9-11 have declared the kalima, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. 9-11 yeah, became a means it wasn't a good thing, but it became a means of how many people declaring the kalima La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. This is something you and I could never have done. Omar left in the morning with what? With the intention of killing the Nabi of Allah. Yeah? In the evening, before the evening, he met his sister. They talked about Islam. It was negative at the beginning. And then my young friends, by the evening, it became positive. And he uttered, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. So there's so much good coming out of it at this moment in time. And inshallah, there will be more good coming out of this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Let's not lose hope. I'm just going to end up with four verses of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, La yayisu min illa illa al al kafirun. Only those that don't believe in Allah lose hope in Allah and lose hope in the power and mercy of Allah. Allah says, وَمَكَرُوا وَمَكَرَ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَاكِرِينَ And they plan, and Allah plans. And there is no one that can plan better than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ مَعَ الْأُسْرِ يُسْرَى إِنَّ مَعَ الْأُسْرِ يُسْرَى With every difficulty there is ease. We've seen the difficulty. We grew up in the difficulty. We've been seeing it for the last 50, 60 years. Insha'Allah, very soon, when it's Allah's plan, we will see the ease. Because Allah says, Allah inna nasrallahi qareeb. Verily, the help of Allah is qareeb. It's close. May Allah give me the tawfiq to act upon what I've said. May Allah give you the tawfiq. Wa akhiru dawan and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Message TV. This is your channel. This is your channel.